Kicking off the list at number 10, farting around. In the earliest accounts of the fool, going back to the 11th century, these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, and right now they're jumping around on tables, telling jokes, doing, doing this shit. It's pretty accurate. It was one of the best jobs to have, this title of a minstrel or a Fool. It was an honor to have, really. The fool's payment was anything but a joke. Roland Le Petoir was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. To fart, to literally He would whistle, jump around, and fart. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table and starts farting all in and around your beans. <laughs> so gross. And then he leaves frogs over your head and then goes and heckles your aunts and uncles. I'd be upset. Christmas Day? What are you doing, man? I'm trying to eat beans. Roland the Farter was his nickname. How great is that? He would also whistle tunes in your face. Air would just come out of this guy from every hole. That's impressive. Number nine, expert jugglers. I can't watch circus performers do anything. It makes me way too anxious. Seeing somebody like losing balance 50 feet above a crowd, they're like, oh. Uh, my toes curl, I can't look. While some think of jesters as nothing but these drunk class clowns who would walk silly and talk sillier, they did some crazy stuff. Juggling was introduced early in the fool's game, but like Romans getting bored of gladiators fighting, juggling just wasn't enough anymore. They had to raise the stakes. So jugglers began throwing swords, daggers, battle axes, Anything you don't want above your head, jesters would juggle it in front of you while you're eating beans. While some can't watch juggling, others surely can't take their eyes off of it. This was used as an advantage in battle, believe it or not. Jesters would juggle knives, swords, whatever they could, but while they were doing it, they would talk smack to the kingdom's enemies. They would insult their enemy, basically roast them so hard that they break formation and would try and fight the jester at once. You're gonna fight Leapfrog Larry, who's juggling six swords at the same time? Good luck. They would literally chirp them until they left formation, and then at that time, the jester's like, go, I got them. Number eight, key delivery. Being a professional comedian is hard work. You could say a thousand hilarious, well thought out bits, but one ill-timed tweet that goes a little too far can ruin your entire career, apparently. Well, back in the day, being a professional fool was no different. You needed to find the balance of humor and wit, and it was harder back then, if anything, than it is now. Most of these jesters were given role of advisor to the king and queen. That's what makes them so important in history. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, yeah, this is kind of where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them bad news, but in a positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in a naval battle. The British just absolutely wiped them out. It was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester brought this news in a positive way. He gave it a positive spin, rather. He said to the king, they didn't even have the guts to jump in the water like our brave French. Where if that was some random dude, his knees would be shaking. He has to tell the king all this horrible stuff, and he's not used to that. Jesters are used to farting on the king's lap. They're the ones to advise for sure. They're definitely the most comfortable with speaking ill truths. Number seven, bad news. Most of the time, jesters knew their way with words. They were royalty. They were smart, despite what their names make you believe. But sometimes the message couldn't be said with a grin or a pun. Sometimes the king would send these court jesters into battle first to deliver that first message. So no matter what the message was, this jester had to go and deliver it in his jester way. That was the whole point. They would tell a clown to be like, hey, go and tell them that we're going to fight. And he'd be like, okay. Jesters were a treat, but they were also quite disposable, sadly. Sometimes the jester would kick off the entire battle, demanding the opposing side to retreat while roasting them at the same time. It was amazing. It makes sense though. What better way to start a battle? A jester runs across the battlefield. He's like, hey, the king said he doesn't want it anymore. He doesn't want the kingdom. You can have it. We're not even gonna fight. It's all good. It's all yours. Uh, apparently the queen has something called ligma. <clears throat> Number six, don't quit your day job. The life of a fool was fun and games, but certainly not all the time. They didn't party all day every day, okay? They weren't the group LMFAO. They had to sleep, they had duties to do. They performed the odd time, but on their off days when they're not juggling knives in front of children, they would tend to household duties, much more daunting than roasting the king in front of his family. They would be assigned to keeper of the hounds. Their hands were quite full during this clown downtime. They would have to travel to markets constantly to purchase livestock for the royal family. They fed the family and then entertained them, a true class act. On top of that, when it came to battle, jesters were the ones to hype up the army the night before. They would play music, tell stories, anything to boost morale. When it came to being on the actual battlefield heading towards battles, jesters would also ride across the front of their army, talking smack about the enemy, you know, still trying to hype them up, even on the day. At number five, 
beavers. Remember a little while ago when I mentioned the medieval practices of Lent and how they ate dolphins because they thought they were fish? Well, we have another animal that is most definitely not a fish, but medieval people believed that it was. Beavers. Yeah, beavers. They thought that because beavers were such good swimmers that they just had to be some kind of fish and were therefore suitable to eat during Lent. Originally, it was just the tail of the beaver that was suitable for Lent because it was considered cold, but later on they figured that the whole animal was good to eat because again, they thought it was a fish. I can't really see how they looked at this furry animal and thought to themselves, ah yes, a fine sea dwelling fish. But hey, these people believed in witches, unicorns, and regularly put animals like pigs and donkeys on trial, so there you go. At right, number four, singing chicken. Continuing on with another insanely weird food from the medieval age, we have one that was pretty dangerous to eat, though the people who lived back then probably didn't know it was so unsafe. Back then, some chefs would prepare a pretty theatrical dish and called it singing chicken. Man, the things that they did to these poor chickens. Anyways, singing chicken was prepared by taking the chicken's neck and tying it with quicksilver and sulfur, and when the bird was heated, it made a sound like it was singing. Why this was necessary? Who the heck knows? There were other versions of these kinds of theatrical meals as well, where swans, pigs, and even fish were made to look like it was breathing fire. Chefs would soak cotton in alcohol and place it inside the animal, and when it was time to serve, they would light the cotton on fire and make the food look like it was some kind of dragon. At number three, roasted swan. A lot of people see swans as beautiful creatures. I mean, I see them as deceptive geese because even though they are pretty, they will still attack you and eat your young, but I digress. Though swans are a lot of people's favorite animals, in medieval times, swans were more so people's favorite food. Yeah, even the swans weren't safe from being devoured. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, since it's a bird, it's probably prepared in a normal way. And to those people, I say, have you been paying attention at all? Nothing was normal back then, and of course they had to make things weird. There were two ways of preparing a swan. The weird way, and the strange way. The first way of preparing the swan was to mince the entrails of a boiled swan with bread, ginger, and blood, and then mix it with vinegar. Yum. And the second way was to cut the bird open, remove its skin, roast it on a spit, and then reclothe it with its skin and feathers and present it to eager guests. Sounds absolutely horrible. At number two, lamprey. Imagine this, a gross, slithery eel with gray scaly skin and a suction cup-like face full of tiny, sharp teeth. Does that sound tasty to you? Because I can't say it does. However, to people in the medieval age, apparently it was finger licking good because this lamprey was all the rage and was actually a favorite of King Henry I of England who was actually said to have died from eating too many lamprey. Lamprey was considered a delicacy and was often enjoyed with a side of hot sauce. I don't care how it's prepared, you cannot catch me eating a sharp toothed worm of the sea. And finally, at number one, live food. I think that by now we understand that medieval cuisine was as much about theatrics as it was about sustenance. Between singing chickens, fire breathing fish, and cock and trices, a lot was happening in the kitchens back then, but by far the weirdest food trend from the medieval age was their live food shows. Because a lot of people loved a good show, chefs came up with a new idea to wow their dinner guests where they would serve an animal that looked to be dead and cooked, only for it to get up and run away when it got to the table. The most common animal used for these theatrics was of course the chicken. To prepare this unorthodox dish, the chef would take the animal, let's use the chicken as an example, and they would pluck it while it was still alive and glaze it to make it look like it had been cooked. They would then wait until the chicken fell asleep in the kitchen and bring it out on a platter. However, just as the chicken was about to be carved up and served, it would wake up and run down the table creating a chaotic dinner. Another common live food that would be served was frog pie. Chefs would put frogs in a pie and then when the top of the pie was cut open, the frogs would jump out and startle the dinner guests. Now how's that for dinner and a show? Number 10, property. It should be no surprise to anyone watching this today, but women's rights and the treatment of women was not everyone's priority in the medieval ages. Dudes were just mean, I'm sorry. Where did it all stem from? I'm not sure, I'm just a guy with blue eyes, and sometimes I say funny stuff. But what I do know is that women were treated more like men's property, which is, that's, that's, that sucks, that's gross, no one likes that. Which they are not, thank you very much. Sometimes women were traded, like currency for livestock animals, land, and just business dealings in general, because women didn't have a say in the matter. Like, I'll give you two goats for my daughter, here you go, dude, which is just, 
That's not a fair deal, dude. That's that's not a trade, man. Not a trade. Number nine, promising young woman. Remember when I said if I talk about medieval times, I was gonna bring this up? It's a classic, a medieval staple. Couldn't couldn't talk about medieval times without it, really. What am I getting at? Well, that's marrying a woman in her midlife, about about 12 years old. Yeah, I know, it's gross. Deplorable, despicable, naughty, and just unsavory. Okay, so people only lived to their mid 30s and 40s back then, so time is of the essence. Sure, I get it, but come on, man. I am hereby banning any cradle robbing or diaper sniping. That includes the dudes who out of high school and they're dating a woman still in high school. I'm banning it, that's it. Chetty says no. Number eight, bedroom watch party. Okay, let me paint the scene for you. It's 2009, you just finished pre-drinking and watching the latest episode of Jersey Shore with your friends. There's enough hair product in your hair to keep a bowl of lime jello still. You slap on some Uggs and head to the club. You meet someone who's cute AF. Maybe it's the tequila, maybe it's the apple bottom jeans, but you wanna come home with this person. Instead of making it to your bedroom, a bathroom nightclub is now your domain for love. People walk by and witness your actions but you do not care because this is your life and it's 2009 and you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that, but medieval times. Yeah, it's not a nightclub, but people would just come into your bedroom to witness that you went through with it on the marriage. Nobody wants that. That's just weird, that's not normal. Come on in, me and my wife are about to, come on in. Number seven. The Hunger Games. In the not so common case of a woman trying to divorce her husband, because you know, she's most likely not being treated very well and she's just not allowed to divorce and it's really just a messy time for women. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Or you fight in combat to determine who wins the divorce. And by winning the divorce, I mean whoever wins lives, yes. This was something that was actually done in medieval Germany. Basically, there's a little arena. Husband gets put into a hole to make it air, I guess. There's a sack of rocks and a club, and then you just full send it and start swinging at each other. I feel like most divorces suck. Not that I would know, I've never been married, but I mean, come on, are the married people really telling me at home right now that they wanna swing rocks and clubs at each other? <laughs> I don't think so. Number six, gross. Kangas Khan, maybe the most down bad dude to ever get on a horse and do what he did. Well, maybe except Arthur Morgan, but he's not real, even though I wish that chiseled, handsome, rugged man was. <sighs> Despite my daydreaming fantasies, I'm here to talk about a really bad dude, Kangas Khan, medieval conqueror and womanizer. He had so many wives, who a good portion of which were forced at sword point to be his wife, and husband and wives were not exactly sitting around the couch uh, watching news together back then. They, they did the deed, whether or not both partners signed off on it. What I'm getting at is he had so many offspring that his DNA is still with us today. 0.5% of the male population on Earth are descendants of the Mongol warrior. That's over 60 million dudes. That's just insane, bro. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you, or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number four, arranged marriages. All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages, as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promise daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number three, marital disputes. I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I like to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. 
but it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is, it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part. And depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yielding times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's no, you guys want, you guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So, here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead, here you go. Crazy. Number 10, famine. This was not modern times and nowhere close to the industrial agriculture industries we have today. Most folks lived in small towns that were self-sufficient with their farms and animals. After paying up or giving up what they had to their lords, of course, the commoners were not left with much. Men were expected to work all day to provide for his lord, family, and himself. Trouble is, if something even slightly disrupts the farming process, and trust me, there's a lot of factors that would lead to that, uh, then some people are gonna go hungry. When people get hungry, they do crazy things. I was crazy once. They locked me in a room full of rubber. Rubber makes me crazy. I was crazy once. They locked me in a room full of rubber. Rubber makes me crazy. Number nine, war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Uh -huh -huh. You guys love that song, I know you do. Picture this. You're a serf working day and night to feed your family. When a town crier brings news to you that your village is going to be under attack and the invaders have been seen coming over the hill, just over yonder, it's somewhere over there. So it's over there. The king is sending his best knights to defend the castle, but you know, like many other folks in many other towns, that to protect your family and your stuff, your pitchfork is going to need a sharpening. And maybe a fire buff. I, li I like fire buffs, they're cool. Yes, war, the worst invention of mankind, when you think about it. War means you need soldiers, and that means men. Except for a few exceptions like Joan of Arc. You can throw them in too. Sadly for the peasants, it's a matter of protecting what's theirs. There's no glory in fighting for someone else's glory if it means your farm gets burned down in an attack, and then you can't eat, and then no one's hungry, and ah, no good. Number eight, pestilence. In case you didn't know, you probably do, but sickness was an issue for the folks in medieval times, especially if you're a man who's working in the fields or the markets or the public, trying to bring home whatever form of currency is appropriate for the area. You can't do anything if you're sick in bed, or at least that's what I used to tell my mom when I wasn't totally faking a stomachache because I didn't want to go to school. I totally wasn't faking it. I was sick. But a big bug going around at the time in people's tummies was the bubonic plague. Yeah, classic. The big one. Some statistics suggest staggering numbers of people succumbing to the plague. Millions of people and the plague isn't a pretty one. Skin turning black from necrosis, boils, blisters, ugh, it's a bad look. You don't, you don't want it. Number seven, serfdom. While not exactly like YouTube's least favorite S-word, it's kind of similar, and it sucks. 
Basically, you're in the lowest of the low in terms of peasantry. You are forced to farm and tend the land that the Lord owns. There's nothing like breaking your back for a guy who doesn't know that you're breaking your back for him. I'm curious, guys. Let me know what's been your worst job and why. I'm, I'm gonna read some comments again in a later video. But yeah, being a serf sucked. Imagine after all that awfulness that you have to pay your boss rent too because you also live on the property that you work. Yeah, not so fun. Pretty messed up. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. Number six, Jester. Imagine trying to write funny and comical things day in and day out until your fingers cramp. And you have to perform your material in front of a bloodthirsty crowd who's just itching to say something the second you make a mistake. Or if you upset the king, it could cost you your head. What a crazy job, right? Huh, I know. However, one jester had it all figured out. The one thing that binds us all together is humans. The type of comedy no scholar or peasant alike can escape. Farting. Yes. Take Roland the Farter, for instance, whose job was to fart. Every Christmas he would show up to the king's place and just let her rip. Boy, do I wish that was my job. Cause honey, let me tell you something. I got some special stuff up on my art. Number five. The Bedroom Handbook. Like previously said before, when you marry someone, it's for life. You learn to love and you do the bedroom dance with that same person for the rest of your life. For some folks, this was their first time. And as we all know, remember, that can be awkward. Whew. Well, imagine if you had a booklet or an instruction manual on what to do when that time comes. Like a Lego manual. Although sometimes even those can be a little confusing. I, I always have to count the pieces. I, I get it confused. Well, some churches back in the oldie times were doing such a thing. The Summe Confessorum, as it was known to be called. It detailed exactly on what days were allowed to make the devil's dance possible. By the time all the rules were read and followed, you were boiled down to a small window about once a week, or sometimes none at all. And especially not on Sundays. Ooh, you better not do that on Sunday, man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. that's the wrong time to do it. Never do it on Sunday. Number four, Dragonborn? This is actually kind of cool. So in Viking and Norse weddings, there was a very unique tradition. We'll call it a tradition where the very handsome and brave groom would be tasked with a quest. Like something right out of Skyrim, actually. The groom was tasked with entering his family tomb and retrieving and or placing a ceremonial blade that acknowledges him tying the knot. Now, is that as cool as fighting off drogers and emptying literally every urn you see in search of golden amethyst? No, no it's not. However, I can't recommend entering anyone's grave before the invention of modern medicine. It's just not a great idea, but still cool nonetheless. Hence, it's on the list. Listen, I just got married. You own grandpa's tomb, grab that knife. Just go in there. Just go grab it. Grandpa died of smallpox. That's okay though. Go in there and grab it. No problem. You come out, <coughs> I got it. And anyway, number three, royal weddings. While poor class citizens did sometimes marry for love and support and to have someone to go through life with as being a woman on her own, back then would prove to be quite difficult. Uh, sometimes difficult more than it should have been. Medieval times set a very troubling precedent for those at the top. A lot of times, princes, princesses, kings, queens, and really anyone who held power or land were oftentimes married off to benefit that of a nation or a kingdom from which they came. In a nutshell, these marriages were political agreements, not holy matrimony, if you can call it that. Many times in history, nations swapped sons and daughters in order to save a little skin. Some marriages might go sour over time, but imagine one that you didn't want to be in from the start. Oof. And if you speak up, your whole kingdom might collapse. Eee. Yeah, not a good, not a good time, not a good scenario. Number two, witnesses. I've talked about it before, but it still doesn't make it any better or easier. Every person you see walking around today was created by a couple things. Two people, a Barry White record, and a little bit of friction. Unless you're a test tube baby. Sometimes like you're a clone in Camino, you know what I mean? And Star Wars, you know the, the big tube thing? Anyway, that's life. However, a lot of these moments are private and they probably should be private. Unless you're an exhibitionist or something. That's how you do things. Well, a lot of times for a marriage to become official, established members from your village or community would come and watch you consummate the marriage. Yes, that's right. Mom, dad, the bishop, heck, maybe even the grave digger down the road because he's got an important job. My question is, what do you say when that's happening? Do you cheer? Do you laugh? Do you... Way to go, kid. You, yeah, that's, that, that's my boy. I don't, what do you do? It's so gross and, ah. Close the door, dad. Number one, divorce by trial. My personal favorite on this list, divorce by trial or divorce by combat. Either or, same thing. It's exactly what it sounds like. What if divorce court had a little less paper signing and a little more club swinging? Sprinkle in a little bit of Hunger Games and bam, boom, you got yourself a medieval divorce. It was a fight until you had to call Dompe the Gravedigger. The 
The wife had a sling and a stone, the man had a club and was stuck in a hole ways deep just to even the odds. May the better may the better spouse win. Whoever was left alive afterwards got to be live free and then now they were divorced because the other spouse was no longer breathing. Who would have who would have thought? Who would have known? That's crazy. On number 10, roast hedgehog. Hedgehogs, am I right? They're cute little spiky balls of fun and they make pretty good pets too. They're so cute that you would never want anything bad to happen to them, right? Well, if you lived in the medieval ages, you might beg to differ because while today we see hedgehogs as these lovable little creatures, back then they were nothing but something to feed your family for dinner. Sorry to anyone who owns a hedgehog. Yeah, hedgehogs were a delicacy back then and there's even a record of a common recipe for them. In the olden days when someone was looking to cook up a hedgehog for dinner, you would first have to unalive it and then gut it, tie it up, and wrap it in pastry. Apparently, if your hedgehog wouldn't unroll after it was uh, taken out, so to speak, you would just have to simply boil it in water and continue the preparation process. Apparently, back then, it was believed that eating hedgehogs helped with medical conditions like throat inflammation and leprosy. Not really sure how effective that was, but it was still a thing. At number nine, porpoise pottage. During Lent, people weren't allowed to eat meat. Normally, people would substitute to do fish into their diet during this time, but if you were one of the wealthy, then you could treat yourself to something a little more extravagant than just plain old fish. For those who could afford it, they would sit down to a seafood feast, and they really ate anything that came out of the sea. We're talking fish, lobster, crabs, eels, and dolphins. Yeah, they thought that dolphins were fish and so safe to eat during Lent. In a recipe book from 1399 written by King Richard II's cooks, there was a recipe for porpoise fermentry, which was basically a sweet and spicy wheat porridge with dolphin on top. It consisted of almond milk and saffron and just sounds absolutely vile. I couldn't imagine what a dolphin would even taste like, but I wouldn't imagine that it would taste very good, especially with almond milk, wheat, and saffron. But would you guys try it? Now before I carry on telling you guys about the weird things that people ate in medieval times, I would first like to take a moment to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number eight, garbage. Ever heard of a garbage plate? It's a dish that originated in Rochester, New York, and it is a big plate of things like macaroni salad, baked beans, french fries, and a bunch of other things. Well, in medieval times, they also sort of had their own garbage plate, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound nearly as good as the one from Rochester. Their garbage was pretty foul, and honestly, I don't think that you could pay me enough to sit down and eat this thing. As the name dictates, garbage was made of, well, garbage. Anything that wasn't used in other dishes was basically thrown into a pot, cooked up with some seasonings, hopes, and dreams. Even the recipe sounds gross, dude. In an excerpt from a medieval cookbook to prepare garbage, it says to quote, take good giblets, aka the garbage, chicken heads, feet, livers, gizzards, and wash them all clean. Throw them into a nice pot and add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, and sage chopped small. Then take bread, steep it in the same broth, draw it through a strainer, add and let it boil till done. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which was sour grape or apple juice, salt, and a little saffron, and serve it forth." End quote. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass on that one, thank you. At number seven, cock and trice. When living in medieval times, people had to be very creative when it came to cooking. You had to create flavors with limited resources while also trying to dodge the risk of poisoning people if you're not careful, but this next dish pushed the boundaries of culinary art so much that Gordon Ramsay would have to call every chef who made this an idiot sandwich. Back in medieval times, some chefs would prepare a dish called cock and rice, and it was kind of a monstrosity. This imaginative dish was made by combining a pig and a chicken into some kind of revolutionary Frankenstein's monster. Essentially, this dish was made by cooking a pig and a chicken, and then the chef would cut both animals in half and then attach the front half of a pig to the rear half of a chicken. Then it would be stuffed and roasted on a spit, glazed in egg yolks and saffron, and topped with a gold leaf before being served to an elite like a king or queen. There was also an alternative version of this dish where instead of having the two halves of the animal mashed together, it would instead have the chicken riding the pig, and some chefs would even adorn the chicken with a knight's helmet for some extra pizzazz. Not sure why this was invented, but it certainly is creative to say the least. At number six, 
roasted cat. We started off this list talking about one common household pet that was traditionally eaten in medieval times, but now we have another, so for anyone who has a feline friend, you might want to skip this part. Roasted cat was yet another bizarre food that was eaten back in the olden days, and I can't really say I'm all that surprised. I mean, they were eating hedgehogs, dolphins, and garbage, so I wouldn't put it past them to take a bite out of Garfield too. Roasted cat was a pretty straightforward dish. They would just marinate it and roast it like they would any other kind of animal, but what makes this dish strange other than the fact that it's a cat was the way that it was prepared and the superstition behind it. Cats already have a lot of superstition behind them so it makes sense that in medieval times they believed all sorts of things about felines but when it came to cooking them it was believed that cutting the head off before cooking it was a vital step because quote it is not for eating for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. End quote. So yeah, don't go eating cat brains, I guess. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced, because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, plague bear. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the dark ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s. But when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? Because anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation, ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages, yeah, that title alone, gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go, keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale, there you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back, so. <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you would leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this was a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, do they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest 
At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilian Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing, as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals, they wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually, something was afoot. That was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. Number 10, Nazi Nazi. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You could be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell are spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle, and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sound just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Number five, 
steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. So you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. When the Catholic Church was running the show during the Middle Ages, you better have been part of the God Squad or else you're gonna join them, apparently. Thomas Aquinas wrote about blasphemy in the Middle Ages saying that if we compare murder and blasphemy as regards to the object of those sins, it is clear that blasphemy, which is a sin committed directly against God, is more grave than murder, which is a sin against one's neighbor. On the other hand, if we compare them in respect of the harm wrought by them, murder is the graver sin, for murder does more harm to one's neighbor than blasphemy does to God. Yeah, that's, that's what you gotta deal with if you went back in time. Good, good luck, hope you're religious. If you spoke ill of the church and had beliefs of your own, God forbid, pun intended, that was one of the most wicked crimes to date. If you were charged with blasphemy, your tongue was removed with hot tongs or pliers. Awful. According to the Old Testament, other punishments would include stoning or hanging. All because you just, you said, I don't like him. I don't like that guy that does things. The way he's doing this, I'm hungry and I'm in pain and my family's dead. I don't know. Sorry. Blasphemy was common because you could accidentally do it, unlike stealing, you know? On my way to the studio today, I slipped on some ice, and let me tell you, if I was in the Middle Ages, I would have been charged twice before 9 a.m. Number three, live in the city. Okay, you may grow up wanting to live in the big city, eh? The Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Whatever, whatever pulls you to the city, it would have been a lot different back then. Living in the city sucked. It was actually preferred to live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Like starving was better than this, really. If you were poor in the city, you had a short and nasty life. Cities were often built near rivers, but it didn't take long for said rivers to be full of sewage. Stinky water. I mentioned the plague earlier. Just like today, numbers pop in large cities, so if disease hit the town, it hit the town pretty hard just constantly wiping out these packed crowds over and over. And maybe you're a fan of the nightlife. Maybe you wish you were able to hit up these local medieval taverns, have a ye old IPA, ale, whatever the hell. It wasn't even that fun. Curfews were strict, and if you were caught outside of that curfew, the odds of your drunk self getting robbed would be pretty high. Also, cities had public bathhouses too, which sounds nice, but again, during the Black Death, maybe let's not take a dip today. Let's, let's just wait. wait, let's just wait a week. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. That's it. Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Boniface VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool. You can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And finally, number one. Witchcraft. Whenever we think back to the Middle Ages, it's hard to forget that we once would accuse others of being a witch. It's like five plus five, I think that's 10. We're like, how did you know that? You're a witch, you're definitely a witch. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and mm, wizardry. No better sous chef than a golden retriever. Just mix it up some potions. To be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so I don't completely disagree on that thought. But cats? What's a cat doing? with a cauldron. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused as well as two dogs. If their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Nothing to do with the poison rye, just all over the floor. It's for sure part-time witch. Villagers believe that witches traveled at night, not by broom, but by riding on the back of your furry friend. And it also wasn't just dogs or cats. They thought witches rode pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. 
I'd be like, I'm good, I'll beat you there. Even so, if you were convicted of being a witch, you had to confess. If you confessed to being a witch, your life was spared, and, and oddly enough, if you refused to confess, then you were executed. In the meantime though, being a witch and all, your head was being dunked in water, you were sleep deprived, these horrible torture methods were used until you were so broken that eventually you just admit to being a witch. You're like, fine, I, me and Airbud, we witch it up, happy, and then you're fine. If you were suspected of witchcraft, you also had to get naked in front of all these creeps while they looked for the devil's mark. The devil's mark being a birthmark or a mole or freckle, blemish on the skin, whatever. All signs of making deals with the devil, apparently. This thing would have, I would have gone to jail for sure for this one. I would have been dead for this, that's huge. Number 10, divorce. Today, divorces can go either which way. Way one, it's a brutal, awful experience for everyone around you. Words are exchanged, property is fought over, and by the end, two lawyers are a couple grand richer, and now the kids get to say dad's house and mom's house. Wow, sounds awful. Or it can be a more pleasant experience where both parties mutually agree it's no longer working out, and they do their best to have a peaceful separation on everyone's behalf. That's nice, and it does happen sometimes. Well, medieval marriage and divorce looked a lot different. Who would have thought? 800 years ago, who would have thought? The main part of divorce really was just being the annulment of the marriage, assuming it was allowed. Rules change depending on when and where it was. Whereas today, like my long-winded joke at the top of this segment, there's much to consider in a divorce, especially the estate. That's probably the main thing, is, is the stuff. It's all about the stuff. The marriage itself is the least of people's worries today. But back then, it was just about just not being married anymore. I want the bricks in the house. Like, what are you gonna, in medieval times, what are you gonna fight over? Like, I want the cows, the cows is mine. Number nine, off with the head. Another way to solve the issue of divorce and marriage was to get rid of your spouse. The same way Polly Walnuts got rid of Mikey Palmis. Gabish. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Most famously, King Henry VIII dispatched a few of his wives as the church really gave him no other way out of the marriages he found himself in. So, you know, off with the head. However, I think it's important to note that King Henry wasn't the only bloated throne sitter to have his wives dealt with soprano style. Things weren't exactly fair for women back then, or at all. Least of all, the, the law. It didn't have everyone's best interest and justice in mind, especially women. So there was a good chance that if the king didn't like you, you were gone. Happened all over. Number eight, adultery. There you were, standing like a wallflower at your town's clubhouse. Ours was called the Lions Club, you know what I'm talking about, small towns. Wearing a little old thing your sister lent you. Cowboy boots clatter as the music gets quieter. Then a handsome young man wearing jeans all over took you by the hand. Oh, romantic. You've been together ever since. I'm sure I, I literally just nailed that for some people. That's pretty much how they're married now. Except now he's not as charming. Now he's got a beer gut and he farts in his sleep. Ugh. Oh well, that's married life. I'm sure the medieval people went through a very similar process. What am I getting at? Well, when you get married, it means you're with that person forever. That includes the bedroom. Well, kings and queens of yieldy times ignored that rule. Besides the obvious political reasons for marrying, which I'll get to later, what was the point of marrying for love if you're just gonna have 30 mistresses or a secret lover? I would list the kings and queens who partook in this, but it would simply be easier to list those that didn't partake in that. You know what I mean though? What's the point? What's the whole point of doing it if you're just gonna, yes, we'll love you together forever and then, how you doing? It just doesn't make any sense. Number seven, soldier on trial. Things weren't all bad for ladies back in medieval times. Sometimes they were given the benefit of the doubt. Like in medieval France, for example, where if a woman did desire a divorce, there was a non-violent way to get one. She and her husband would meet in front of a group for proceedings regarding their marital prowess in the bedroom. Of course, why else would I be talking about it? Meaning she had to prove that he could not prove himself a man in the bedroom. Happens to a lot of guys. In a nutshell, that means a group of people would handle, grab, stare, and examine a man's gabagool, piche deal, sausage, Woody the Woodpecker, the Olive Branch, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Ballpark Hot Dog, the Ambassador, the Trombone, the One-Eyed Bob, and the Heat Seeking Trouser Rocket. That's a good <laughs> one. You guys get the point. It was a very embarrassing process, but if he couldn't produce results, results in front of prying eyes, then, well, that means she's leaving. Do you imagine that? Number six, no Irish grandma. In society, we've decided that there are rules and laws and just rules that really just need to be followed in order to have an effective society. Like, no harming others or laws that help keep us safe. However, there's some laws that just don't need to be said. Some rules are self-explanatory, like no diving in shallow water. Yeah, that makes sense, you don't wanna hurt yourself. No pooping in public, of course not, I would never. 
I promise. And you can't marry your nan. That's right, you can't marry your nan. Yes, that's right. A law from medieval Ireland hits us with a marriage law stating that no man shall marry the wife of his granddad. You see, that's one you didn't have to tell us. We knew that. I knew that. Everybody knew that. Marriage laws were changing at the time because of English rule, and a lot of other laws were changing too, but the close family nature of their marriages, well, things got a little confusing. It was just about the time. I'm not allowed to say in sound things, but it was in that's what it was. So they, they were changing laws, which was kind of gross. Ugh. Now I feel gross talking about it. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with Saint Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. At number three, Belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you want to call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old, people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right, belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells shells, and in Europe, the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? Just got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. 
This warrior had his hand amputated. However, the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now, I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could and that was a knife as a placeholder or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Number 10. Nightman. Now, the name Nightman sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? If you're part of the Nightman, you might be a guild that watches over the dark, you know, protecting people like a superhero team, fighters of the day man, master of karate and all that. Well, if only life were that cool. No, you definitely would not want to be a Nightman. A Nightman was a very polite name for a job that boiled down to guy who cleaned human feces out of the cesspit. Yeah. You ever use a septic tank and thought, wow, this is prehistoric technology? Well, imagine a medieval precursor to a septic tank, if you will, and you've got yourself a cesspit. Easily one of the crappiest jobs in human history. Now, the name makes it sound like you'd only be doing this for a few hours, right? Were it so easy, humble nightman? Nightmen would dig for weeks at a time gathering their goods, as they were usually paid by weight, not hours. Consider that, and then consider that any of the lovely amenities you and I have to avoid bacteria, masks, sanitizers, these guys had never even heard of and were shoveling stacks of crap by the literal ton with their hands and faces uncovered, huffing in unimaginable fumes. I imagine that's the kind of work that changes a man on the inside forever. Number 9. Fuller Perhaps one step down from the humble work of shoveling refuse all day like a nightman is the honest life of a fuller. You see, a fuller's job was to remove the oils from cloth woven from sheepskin and wool. Wool, naturally waterproof thanks to the oils on the sheep's skin, but the underside is very coarse and easily frayed and therefore needed to be dealt with before it can be made into things. Nowadays, we would just use an alkaline solution, call it a day. However, back then, chemistry sets weren't really like available, so you'd have to make do with what you had, right? And what better source of natural alkaline than in pee? Specifically old pee, nice and stale. We're looking for that burnt sienna orange. So the fuller takes the woven wool and cloth, soaks it in a nice giant tub full of old pee, and then stomps on it like you're crushing grapes for wine. Except it's not at all like you're crushing grapes for wine because you're stomping on wool full of old pee. It was fairly common as well for fullers to, uh, to source their own alkaline solution, for lack of a better word. There was no royal distributor of old pee. You couldn't stroll up to the pee man. So they'd have to scrounge and collect it themselves. And if that meant heading to public toilets and private homes, knocking on the front door with their hands held open for a big handout, you know, every drop counts. I can't believe I'm getting paid to say this. Number eight, a whipping boy. Have you ever heard the expression whipping boy to be someone's whipping boy? I know I've certainly heard it a lot, but the history of it is actually pretty fascinating. It was a real position. And basically your whole job as whipping boy was to take the licks for a misbehaving royal. When you have an up and coming noble figure, a prince, a duke, this sort of thing, when they're being taught by their tutors, it would be an unimaginable offense to strike the royal for misbehaving as their status was leagues above the tutors. But you can't have someone misbehaving without any retribution at all, right? A little negative motivation to push you to work harder and learn harder. That is where a whipping boy comes in. The whipping boy, sometimes a friend of the prince being taught, would be struck in front of the prince in order to motivate him to not commit the same transgressions. It seems a bit like a bit of a flawed system because from what I know of medieval European history, it's that kings and princes were rarely remembered for their generosity and compassion for their employees. Now, bizarrely, whipping boy was actually seen as a fairly desirable position since it meant you had like an in with the king. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure many young princes saw the guy who was being beaten over the head with a broom and thought this man is my equal and my confidant and a trusted ally. Number Number seven, groom of the stool. Ah, now this is a fancy sounding job title, groom of the stool. Got a bit of an air of quality to it. In truth, it actually was a bit of a respected lofty position. You had a very close hand to the royal throne. You had a very close hand to the throne. You had your hand pretty much behind the king's bottom at all times. 
The groom of the stool, to put it gently, was the royal wiper. You see, there's no one bigger or more important than the king, right? The king is like a god amongst common men, and no god should have to debase themselves to something as absolutely humiliating, as dehumanizing as using the bathroom by yourself. So that's where the groom of the stool triumphantly strides in, washcloth in hand. You were kept on retainer whenever the king felt nature's call. You were instructed to fetch the chair and take care of business. And the wipe? That's all you. That's all groom of the stool, baby. That's your moment to shine. And you know, a lot of grooms really got creative with this. They could show off their style, technique, wrist control. There's a lot of artistry to it that I think people realized. The groom of the king did more than just fetching and wiping too. As the man most connected with royal stool, the groom also shared the responsibility of monitoring what was going on down there for any changes in the king's health. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but much heavier is the hand that wipes the bottom. Number six, cat gut. Okay, in contrast to the last one that had a nice name, this one has a disgusting name, cat gut. Way back when in yesteryear, they didn't have the same tools available to us now when crafting musical instruments, so they had to get creative. If you wanted to hear something beautiful on violin, you couldn't just head on down to Long and McQuaid and pick up a pack of strings. You'd need a guy willing to get his hands wrist deep in some cat gut. Now, confusingly, no actual cats were involved, but plenty of sheep were. Violin strings were made of sheep's guts, and they would make the strings by twisting strands of sheep's intestines and innards together. Lovely. They'd have to be careful while butchering the animals to make sure they didn't accidentally harm any of the goods. This process would take hours out of time, from the butchering, the careful removal of the organs, and then they needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution to be clean since they were inside a sheep, and then stared at for a few hours to make sure nothing was going wrong, and then the drying process could begin. They say there is nothing more exciting than watching sheep guts dry. And then you can get your twist on, make them into a violin. Absolutely disgusting, but when you hear the sweet strings of Ave Maria and you hear how finely tuned those sheep intestines are, you know it's all worth it. Number five, business casual. Let's get one thing out of the way. Jesters did not dress like this all of the time. That would be amazing, but let's get real, that would be quite itchy. I don't know, all those tights, can't wash your stuff back in the day. I don't know, I didn't want to get into it. Handling the hounds while wearing jingle bells also, you'd be a walking, talking chew toy. Bad idea. They dressed like normal people, of course. Well, rather they dressed like their masters did. They were hired as businessmen who spoke with purpose, and then when the time came, they would lean into whatever skill they brought to the table, be it juggling, singing, playing music, whatever. Now the attire of a jester is what we recognize the most. Their fit was pretty unreal. Their outfit was bright, usually to get attention, but jesters also wanted to dress as comedically as they could. They wore colors that didn't match well together. They wore odd layers overlapping each other, just flaps of jesterness coming off. It grabbed your eye mid-stew. Their headgear was also quite fun. The ears were supposed to be the ears of a donkey. The ears of an ass, rather. With bells, of course, because, you know, they're fun. Number four, all around the world. Contrary to popular belief, the origins of a court jester did not begin with medieval castles or anything in the English days. They were around long before then. In ancient Rome, there were four types of jesters. There were Sanio jesters, who were pretty much mimes. They would make crazy facial expressions, their physicality was on point, they didn't wear masks or say words. Stupidest clowns, great name, did wear masks. They were the full-on clown package. All the ruffles, the hidden face, tall silly hats, big bellies, really creepy, terrifying. I don't like clowns. They would use their riddles to entertain. They would use their words, while the other guys just used their bodies. The Skura jesters were picked solely on their appearance. See, ancient Romans weren't as inclusive or well-mannered when it came to people looking different or having disabilities, so sadly they were hired on their oddities, to say the least. The fourth kind was moriones, is where we got the word moron from. They were the closest thing to our English jester that we have now. They would roast everybody, have a silly walk, a funny talk, and during the festival of Saturnalia, the shortest day of the year, these morons would be the lord of misrule. They would rule the day and tell everyone what to do. It was often a pretty silly time. Imagine an improv teacher doubling down as a dean for the day. Now you get it. Number three not a trickster. Tricksters, clown, and jesters are commonly mixed up, and honestly, it's that's totally fair. One has a nose that goes bonk, the other dances with jingle bells, and the other plays tricks. It's pretty much the same to us now in our modern days, but tricksters have an entirely different origin than jesters. Jesters came from ancient Roman times. Tricksters from Norse mythology. Hermes, for example, in history, he was considered a trickster of his time. He was the messenger of the gods who also just happened to invent lying. 
not, uh, not a good combo. So not only do they go against the rules of their kingdom, but they also go against our laws of physics for the most part. And this has us intrigued still to this day. We're bringing Loki the trickster to life. He's fighting the Avengers. He's on Loki season two on Disney Plus. It's still going. But back in Norse mythology, Loki was a shapeshifter who supposedly gave birth to Odin's horse must have hurt. Over time, the role of a trickster changed, and a lot of these fairy tales, we have trickster characters like Rumpelstiltskin, who will you know, pop out of a bush and then make Shrek sign away the day he got married. They screw things up, more or less. That's the trickster. Number two, Jane Fool. One of the few female jesters in history. Here we go. We know about jesters enough now where we can move on to specific people from history. Like Jane Fool, for example. She was included in a royal family portrait. That's a big deal. She's in the background peeking through a doorway. That's pretty creepy, funny, and also pretty epic. She was never trained to be a jester per se, but she was born with the right idea of how to entertain. She was born a comic. She would say what was on her mind. She loved reminding the court that all men were fools before God. She liked to level people, bring them down off their, you know, throne. She would say shit like that, you know, she was great. She was close to King Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Parr, and rumor has it, she was besties with Queen Mary the first. The only person dressed as well as the queen back then was Jane Fool. And finally, number one, Stanchik. One of the saddest paintings of all time, that of the sad clown, Stanchik. The court jester was working under the command of Sigismund the Old in the early 1500s. Now he was one of the most famous jesters in Poland. He was employed by three different kings, quite a big deal. So he never lost steam over time, but something did happen. He was considered one of the wisest, and one tale from his time has stuck with many historians. He was often upset with the king, specifically when Sigismund brought in a giant bear from Lithuania and then released it into the wild to later hunt. Sounds like a fun game, I guess. Or, you know, play Guess Who, that works as well. But what happened was the bear ended up hunting the king and even took his queen off of her high horse. Literally, she fell off her horse, was attacked. It was kind of brutal, I don't want to talk about it. Stanchik straight up ran away after this point. He jingled into the night and then everybody talked about him. How could he? He just left, I could have never. <gasps> He ended up defending his actions by saying it's a greater folly to let out a bear that was already locked in a cage. What a roast. A little roast and run. This painting shows the sad jester sitting next to news that the Splensk has fallen to the Russians. The life of a clown is nothing but sadness, apparently. What a good note to end on. Number 10, universities. Okay, owing a lot of school debt myself, I know a little thing or two about the educational institution. But when did they start and where and why? Universities have been around for like the last 13,000 years, apparently. With the newest uncovered Gobekli Tepe being flirted with possibly being the first university or educational hotspot in the world. But uni uni with like school colors and teams and stuff, that's straight middle high ages right there. University of Oxford was created in 1096. That's the classic riddle, isn't it? Which is older, the Aztecs or Oxford? Ever heard that one before? Yeah, these things are like old, old. A university for law and medicine was created in the year of 1088, the University of Bologna in Italy. Yeah, it became a thing when an organized group of students under the Latin motto of, quote, nourishing mother of the studies was created. Pretty academic, if you ask me. University of Cambridge, 1209. Like, this is like almost a thousand years ago, y'all. At least some of the Middle Ages had some good traditions, along with like how to sever heads for court and stuff like that. I wonder if someone still owes school debt from like 1208, you know? Five shillings a month kind of deal. Number nine, Hastings. Medieval times wouldn't really be the medieval times without a couple of hundreds of swords clinking and clanking against a couple of other hundreds hundreds of swords clinking and clanking. Well, thousands actually. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was a crucial part of business back in the day. New treaty signed, new land discovered, usually started and ended with a battle. The Battle of Hastings, one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. Norman French army of William, the Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godswinson. The childless King Edward the Confessor in 1066 set up a succession struggle between families and the throne. Harold was crowned king after Edward's death, but faced invasion by William. William and the Norwegian King Harold III of Norway. The battle lasted from dusk till dawn and William was crowned as king on Christmas Day 1066. Continued rebellions and resistance to Williams continued, but Hastings marked the start of this ancient British rule and cemented their place amongst Europe as the leading power in both army, academia, and religion. Basically, a really key time where everyone was fighting, Game of Thrones style for Europe. Like all of Europe. Lots of swords and heads type stuff. Number eight, taxes. Hey, tax season's coming up. Make sure you have have everything nice and neatly organized. I know I don't. But why do we have to do them, you know? Where does this you owe me this come from?
come from. The Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book was a book created under William I, also known as William the Conqueror. The same name victor in the battle we just talked about. So medieval to name yourself the victor, isn't it? It is I, Kyle, the winner. Yeah, this guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this was the first time surveyors kind of went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for just doing you. Men would just show up at your house asking how much you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh, Mildred? Right, and just another five for the phone plan. <sighs> Tax season's coming up. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Owing someone money for just living on their land, trying to make an honest living? How dare they? Thank God that didn't catch on. Speaking of, I got a phone H&R Block. Number seven, The Crusades. We hear about it a lot, but we need more movies and Netflix shows about this time because it's really rich in history here. A three-part miniseries spanning over like 300 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred lands and lands in the Middle East. Wars that resulted in like six million deaths. The Knights Templar, of course, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers, horseback, bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, the Navy SEALs of their time. Richard the First, leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary, you know? It wasn't ever like Richard the Billy Goat or Henry the Butterfly. Nah, we need fear. 300 years of religion, invasions, torture, political chess. It was the Wild West before the Wild West. Well, I guess the Wild East. The Wild Wild East, yeah. Number six, court. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. PETA would have an absolute field day with this next one. But again, it's like a thousand years ago and people were not really sure what they were doing back then. Some things were innovative and great, and then there was like trying a rat before a court of law for eating food. Yeah. It's 1386 in the Norman city of Falaise, and ruthless and a rowdy crowd gathered to witness the execution of the city's most infamous convicted murderer. Spectators dressed in their best, and the prisoner was even given a last suit and a last meal for the occasion. I hereby sentence Mr. Wigglesworth to beheading. <gasps> Gasps everywhere. Yeah, a pig. Yeah, they tried a pig and sentenced it to a beheading. Like, also, isn't that just called breakfast? For more than like 300 years all throughout Europe, strange lawsuits tried pigs, dogs, foxes, birds, even grasshoppers and slugs for crimes. Basically anything against people, property, and God himself. It started with creatures who had maimed or killed humans of importance, then animals that stole and ate crops, then like the snail made me do it type stuff. Yeah, prosecution after prosecution. This stuff's weird, right? Your honor, a small recess, please. Okay, basically what we're gonna tell them is that Five, the moss. I ain't gonna come in here and tell you I know what it's like to be a woman or pretend I understand. There's been lots of great photos of humans that have been taken throughout history, but one that we miss for sure is when I was a kid and I learned what happens to women on those special couple days of every month. Not shock, just confusion. The look on my face, it was it was priceless. I wish I wish y'all could have seen it. We got things mostly figured out now though, but think about the past. Medieval times. Not an understanding time for ladies. There were just no products to help in that scenario. So, have you ever wondered what they did? I did, weird thing to think I guess, but oh well. Moss pads, yeah. Take some moss, you wrap it up in a cloth, bada bing, bada boom, now you're in business. Which actually is really smart when you think about it. I never would have thought of that, but that's, I'm a dude, so I, would, I wouldn't think about that. I just don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think about those big thinking thoughts and things sometimes. I'm just a big dumb guy. Number four, witch hunt. This is also a time where if a woman speaks out of line or does something to upset the feng shui of things, there's a good chance she will get labeled a witch and burned at the stake. This was becoming an issue because well, it was becoming a witch hunt, meaning anything that was slightly not cool or basically anything people feared or disliked could be labeled witchcraft. And thus likely an innocent woman would be burned at the stake. I mean, it sounds like they had it down to a science, really. Woman does something crazy, will bring out the charcoal briquettes. No, no, see, that's that's not right. It's not like they could have done this amazing thing called investigate. You know, see if the woman was actually innocent or the claims that she was a witch because she wants to be paid a fair wage like a man. Mm, that doesn't really sound like witchcraft to me. Maybe don't be so hasty to bust out the pitch and torches. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Number three, you gotta do what you gotta do. I know what it's like to be down on your luck. Trust me, it sucks. It's not fun. But you budget. Save and work hard. You'll be back in the black before you know it. Women of medieval times got up and went to work. 
The kind of work a lot of women were forced to do because of circumstances. The oldest profession in the book, selling booty. It's been happening since day one and it won't be going anywhere soon. Now, I'm not here to condemn that kind of work. And funny enough, in medieval times, it was considered to be an actual profession. I just feel if you're gonna be in that line of work, it should be your choice. I'm a Las Vegas kind of guy. I love gambling, boozing, and the freedom to do what you want after strolling out of a casino after too much drinking and gambling. If you know what I mean. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to make the bread, and they just had to do what they had to do. And that's it. Number two, Hell Hath No Fury. Princess Olga of Kiev was a prime example of Hell Hath No Fury like a woman scorned. Long story short, her husband was torn apart by trees. Some gruesome stuff. It was actually, if you're looking, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So like the Sith on its worst behavior, she plotted her revenge. When 20 men she deemed were all responsible for her husband's passing were coming into town, she had a large ditch dug where they were buried alive. That is that is so heinous, I, I can't even. She then extended a welcome to more of the men responsible. When they arrived, she invited them to wash up in her bathhouse, where she had the doors locked and the place torched, like it was a witch hunt or something. Just had them cooked, just threw, just cooked them up. Just, but I mean, they, they burn women, so why not? Why not cook some dudes? Uh, okay. Number one, honestly, who throws a shoe? If you've ever been to a wedding, then you've probably seen the bride throw a bouquet of flowers to waiting bridesmaids and other lucky ladies. Because the lady who catches the flowers is the next woman to be swept off her feet and to be married. Put a ring on it. Kind of ending on a wholesome note here, which is kind of nice, but it's still a, a little messed up. Hear me out. In medieval times, it wasn't flowers. It was shoes. At first, it doesn't seem so bad, right? Shoes. We'll throw some shoes around. Why not? Besides, you know, the, the shoe being thrown too hard. You won't want to catch a loafer on the side of the head. That, that would hurt. I I think we forget how filthy our shoes can be. I mean, they walk through everything, dirt, mud, blood, and if you're in medieval times, having a good old-fashioned wedding in the village probably meant some manure. Eesh. Well, I'm all about tradition, but maybe we could throw the flowers instead. They just smell better, and you know, there's just there's less poop. Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman, who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard for his parents' unmarried status. In return, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lies. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. Number 9 is Jenny cragging it. Edward III of England was so tired of his royal court and nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in times of need. Edward mandated a mass maximum belt size, and also, if you watched part one, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 1856. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. German purity law is number eight. Beer is Germany's national drink, and that's nothing new. The Germans have been indulging for thousands of years. Typically, beer was produced in groups and always made of pure grain, until the purity laws made by Wilhelm IV in 1516 Bavaria. Germans, and most people of the medieval and middle ages, didn't drink water as it was often deeply contaminated. They drank beer. The law imposed was aimed at preventing crops used to make bread from being squandered on brewing, so it stipulates that only water, barley, and hops were allowed to be used as key ingredients for beer production. At first, brewers thought this was ludicrous and unusual to decide, but turns out Wilhelm was actually onto something with this combination. This original law went on to become the core of German beer purity laws that affected
to German brewing to this day, which makes them the oldest regulations related to food and drink in the world. The only change to it in recent history was the adding of yeast. The Brewers Association of Germany wants the 5th century old law governing how German beer is made to become part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. It would join the Argentinian tango, Iranian carpet weaving, and French gastronomy, among other famous traditions that are considered unique and worth protecting. Let's talk sumptuary laws with the Spanish garment laws, number 7 in the countdown. Sumptuary laws, which we discussed in part 1, are placed in to control the nobility and their consumption and displays of material goods. In the case of Spain, there are many sumptuary laws in place as early as the Spartan era. In the 13th century, for example, Siena passed a provision reducing the trains on women's dresses, which was a direct effort to curb a purely aristocratic style. In 1356, the city of Florence proclaimed it illegal for women to have buttons on their clothing without a corresponding buttonhole. And also, no one other than the king was illegally permitted to wear a scarlet rain cape. Also in Florence, it was studied how sumptuary legislation around fashion served as a tool to encourage marriage in a society where excessive extravagance of men providing clothing for the women and their families exasperated the custom of very expensive dowries. If her standards were already up, you had to work harder to pay for her, I guess. And a delay in marriage did mean a dip in population. While there are ample examples of the laws themselves, similar to many other sumptuary laws, there's virtually no record of their enforcements or punishments. Oftentimes, this is because nobility themselves violated their own laws that they made for themselves. Without evidence of how exactly these laws were enforced or whether they were enforced at all, it remains extremely difficult to discuss their social impact, the attitude civilians had towards them as well. Did they act accordingly so as not to face legal difficulties or the payment of fines? Who knows? Not us. So on to the next. Refusing knighthood comes in at number 6. This law was put into place in 1233. Why you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're gonna have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. Number 5. Assassination Let's say for a second you ain't such a bad guy. Let's say you're a king that everyone likes. You listen to the people's woes of hunger and pain. You distribute the wealth and your fashion isn't too ridiculous for the time. And I'll get to that later because that's, that's definitely a point. You care, which for the time is rare. Well, that's too bad because a lot of men in history, whether they were loved, hated, or something in between, there's always someone lurking around the corner waiting to pour poison in your ear whilst you sleep. Yes, the art of assassination, or at least as I'm told it uh, from ninja movies and Assassin's Creed. Many have and will succumb to an assassin, whether it was for political, financial, or just crazy reasons. It happens, and for some reason, no one ever expects to hit him blades. Well, I know, I know it. And I would never let my guard down for a second to allow that to happen. All right, we're good. We're fine. Just check. Number four, boiling in oil. Okay, let's just say you got caught in a Shakespearean crime of attempting to poison your king. Something about poison in the ear or something. Oh, do not fear, good friends, because you better call Ched. That's right, your your internet lawyer. Doctor, fireman too. Don't forget that, I'm a doctor and a fireman. I do it all, folks. Well, I'd come to defend you in trial, but this isn't exactly a time for fair trials and innocence until proven guilty. And the opposite. I mean, come on, you got off easy, kid. They're just gonna boil you in oil, it's easy. Roaring flames, big metal pot, and they're slowly gonna dip you in. Won't be that bad. You'll be screaming in pure agony for five, ten minutes tops. What's the worst that can happen? Well, it'll be the worst pain that you've ever felt in your entire life, but hey, at least you'll look like a Popeye's drumstick later, am I right? Anyway, kid, if you need my legal services again, just uh, give me a call, if you can. I have to go help this bald guy in an RV, something about a lab, I don't know. Good luck. Number three, men's fashion. I know it was a long time ago, but what the heck happened? Calves were in, like big, they like big calves for some reason, I don't know why. I got big calves, you know what I'm saying? And so were Wario shoes, because Wario. As much as I love Wario, since I basically am him, I mean, that doesn't mean I want to look like and feel like him. 
Longer the shoes, the higher the social status. Weird, right? I know. This was also the era of tunics. And if there's anything I've learned from watching Hollywood movies, and I've learned a lot, it's that you don't trust a guy in a tunic. So, if everyone around you is wearing a tunic, who the heck can you trust? Sheesh, no wonder kings were so paranoid. Except for Link, he's cool. We, we, we can trust him. We like Link from Zelda. He's, pre he's pretty sick. As for poor men and serfs, you wore basically whatever you could make or afford, which isn't much. There's no long shoes in the potato fields. I'll stick to my plaid. Lots of plaid. I can't help it, I'm Canadian. Number two, the rack. Ever just wake up one morning and give a big old stretch because it's Saturday morning, you got to sleep in, the sun's shining, and your bones feel warm from a little bit of sun that's just creeping through from the window. You take a deep breath of fresh air and walk downstairs to your fridge to prepare a feast for breakfast, fit for a king. To think of a day like that starts with a stretch. Well, medieval men got to stretch too, thanks to the help of a device called the rack. Think of a ratchet strap, except instead of your dad yelling at you to make sure the trailer is strapped down, you're the strap that's being stretched. Yes, the rack was a means of torment. Basically, your ankles were tied down at one end, your wrists were tied down at the other, and a large sweaty man turns a gear, and then you get stretched out like a pair of jeans you haven't worn since high school. No, that's right, I know. No, you can keep trying them on, but they ain't gonna fit. That's okay, keep telling yourself that, that's fine. Mine don't fit either. Number one, bloodletting. This is just always so weird to me. I, I, I just don't do well with blood at all, actually. I, I got some stories about that, maybe for another day. But basically, there was this medical practice floating around back then. If you were sick, not well, or you just needed to refresh, a medical professional, and I use that term loosely, a medical professional would treat your veins the same way your dad treats a Ford Bronco getting an oil change. Ooh, gross. Did it help? Eh, not really. Am I getting lightheaded just thinking about it? Yes, yes I am, actually. And, I, and I'm being for real, I, I get lightheaded thinking about it. Not even kidding on that one. For real, getting woozy. Kick it off the list at number 10, black cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory the IX, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cults meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now at first when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine. Flat Earth? Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well, even going back Further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman law laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. 
Sorry, Big Chad. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just flying, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like, really, was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know. Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 1560. Which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, helmet of chicken. Wind the clock back 10 years ago. I was but a humble freshman in high school. I was green behind the ears. I didn't know what to expect. Sure, people had prepped me for the worst, but I just didn't know what to expect. I got even more nervous when I saw the pretty girls showing up. Gosh, they were so pretty. <sighs> Someone be my girlfriend? But I relaxed. I knew I was okay because at lunchtime I was gonna watch my favorite YouTube channel, Epic Meal Time. Besides this one, it's a good channel, you should check it out. We're awesome. They made combinations of food that I didn't even think were possible. I was absorbed into their culture, and who wasn't? Why do I bring the awkward time of 2012 back up? Well, that's because the Medieval Times had their own version of a turducken. It, sort of. While it's not a chicken inside a duck inside a turkey inside a pig covered in bacon like EMT did, it's similar and perhaps off-putting for our veggie fans. Basically, there was a chicken sewn to a pig to look like a knight riding on a horse. And yes, I'm sure the chef washed his hands. Right? Number four, going to the schedule de -lifing. Entertainment wasn't as accessible or the same as it is now. In modern times, we pull up our phones, turn on our laptops, sit in front of the TV, and there is all the entertainment we need, from battles to baby drama. But back in the Middle Ages, there wasn't much to do after you were done your work for the day. There were forms of entertainment, music, theater, games, sports, etc. But a favorite would have to be going to see the latest ne'er-do-well lose their head. Public shows of punishment were not just something you went to see when you were bored. Actually, their more important purpose was as a deterrent for anyone who thought of maybe committing a crime. And yeah, that would do the trick. It was also a good way to finalize the trial of a criminal for all those who were affected or who were part of the village. Eventually, they became more of a private affair, but not entirely with the last public de-lifing in the United States happening in 1936. Let's not bring this one back. No, I'm good. 
a pass. Number three, witch trials. Speaking of scheduled delifing, witch trials, or rather, uh, get rid of anyone who's been deemed a witch, which, in case you didn't know, was uh, as simple as this. Right then, the young woman down the lane is smarter than her boys in the school. Right then, folks, pitchforks and torches it is. Unfortunately, for a lot of women at the time, it was tough. When has it not been, right ladies? While some men were declared witches too, this was a tool really for people with power to get rid of those who dare oppose them. There's too many royals to mention who took part in this, however, one stands out as bloody Queen Mary. Names like this were not given for no reason. She was known for sending witches and heretics alike to the stake to be cooked. Number two, outlaw. In movies and TV, characters named as outlaws, specifically in the Wild West sense, are seen as cool guys, outsiders, and wanderers with an air of mystery and possibly power. Trust me when I say it was not what she wanted to be, especially in the medieval times. If you were declared an outlaw in the Middle Ages, you lost all rights, possessions, and any kind of protection being part of society would give you, including people getting in trouble for ending your stay on this plane of existence. You are forced to fend for yourself with nothing to your name, and in a world rife with disease, wars, bandits, and very little readily available food or water, things get harsh quick. If you didn't have a buddy to turn to for help, who you knew for a fact would not literally stab you in the back, then you were pretty screwed. Luckily, I have Andrew. Right? Yeah! Number one, ladies. Okay, so let's say you're married. Husband tends the crops. You as the wife take care of the home. This isn't a statement about the patriarchy. I'm just saying taking care of the home is just as important back then. Seriously, it is. Well, your husband comes in from tending the fields one night with a fever. Uh-oh, he's fallen ill, and now he's perished. Now you're left alone with no income and a society that's probably not okay with you working. So that means it's time to pull up your pants. Well, actually, pull them down, as in a scenario like this, it would be time to work that street corner, and a lot of women did do that. The same way Adam works on building Legos in his dungeon. A joke. But as they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, and folks, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Tradition or not. Kicking off the list at number 10, leave. One of the first things you'd want to do if you magically were able to travel back to the Middle Ages is come right back. Yeah, it's not knights in shining armor and drinking unlimited IPAs in a heated cot. It was the Dark Ages. It sucked. More often than not, if you lived through the Middle Ages, you never left your village. Because where would you go? The world is also dark and dangerous. Nothing's built yet. You can't warm up in a coffee shop until your Uber arrives, right? Most travelers just slept outside or under some bushes. Records from that time show that the average person didn't travel in their entire life. The rest of this list should also explain why. Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight savings. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as a <laughs> recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like. Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. It gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. Finish work. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, forget a mask. The plague made a mark on humanity in the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't wear a mask and social distance. When Europeans were hit with the Black Death in 1348, fleas carried by rats were mostly to blame. Around one third of the population was killed and it was easily contracted. One sneeze later and your lungs are filling up with liquid. Life expectancy in the late 14th century was 20 years old because of this thing. There was little to no knowledge about germs or how they were spreading, so you'd be in the middle of a literal plague. There'd be bodies lying everywhere, people were dumping they're doo doo at windows. Be like, oh, good evening, madam. And then you'd inhale and then. Number seven, get married. Love is in the air. In the dark ages, marriage was difficult to do. This was long before divorce lawyers came around to get every last drop of you. It was so easy that if you loved somebody, you would just announce that now you're married. Chris, we're married now. Isn't that crazy? That's how easy it was. Boom. 
No need for a priest, big celebration, paperwork? Who has time for that? Nobody likes that. Sex before marriage, of course, was also a no-no. So if somebody just happened to wander into the wrong chamber and caught you doing the dirty, all you'd have to do is lie on the spot and say that you're married and then be like, get out, weirdo. And they're like, ah, crap, they're married. We'll try again later. But more often than not, witnesses would be asked to be present when this marriage happened because the sad reality is that guys would often go through all this, get in bed, do the and then deny ever agreeing to the union in the next town when he's shacking up with somebody else. Horrible. Number six, disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturbed the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe you had an argument and got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old ha <laughs> one two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, the Great Charter. Ah yes, time for some peace. Well, kinda. A peace treaty, the initial document containing specific grievances under King John's rule. The year is 1215. Since these animals can't follow the rules, maybe we need to jot up some rules to follow ourselves. A document setting out the laws and limitations for the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts to follow. Like, no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the Law of the land. Write all that down. Please write it down. Laws were important, and sometimes people needed to face the music. After John's death, the government of his son, Henry III, revised the document in 1216, dumbing it down in a little less strict and churchy book of rules type way. Less hearsay and more evidence kind of laws. Of course, still in folio, so V's were U's and L's were also the number one, so a little confusing sometimes, to say the least. Number four, Templars. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. I feel like you have to say that with a deep voice or it sounds weird. The Knights Templar, aka the Order of Solomon's Temple, or simply the Templars. Basically a Catholic military order group of one of the most wealthiest military groups in all of history. No pressure. Founded in 1119, based out of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a couple hundred years of this Navy SEALs type organization. Endorsed and encouraged under the Roman Catholic Church of Pope Innocent II. What a name. The Templars, an extremely trained super soldier outfit with the distinctive white mantles with the red cross. They were like the most skilled fighting units out of the entire Crusades Wars. What people don't know is about 90% of the organization was behind closed doors, ranging a network of financial techniques, manipulations, and treaties for the next thousands of years. Yeah, everybody focuses on the fighting part, but the chess game being played economically at the same time behind closed doors was much more terrifying. Basically, the world's first corporation with a security team. Number three, knights. Keeping with the themes of the medieval times, other outfits of highly trained religious secret organizations, knights, brotherhood, fighting, all that uh, good stuff. Another knightly order, the Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem, also commonly known as the Teutonic Order. Thousand years ago again, kind of like the Templars being a Catholic religious institution founded as a military society. We're talking 1190 in Jerusalem. It was formed to aid Christians and protect them in the Holy Lands where they would establish hospitals and churches. The order, more of a small voluntary outfit made up of mercenary military memberships, basically old dogs who could still fight were looking to do some private security work. The Teutonic Knights were rich too, which led them to hire older and more experienced mercenaries from all parts of Europe. Dude, this is where all these secret societies started, huh? Couple initiations, couple tattoos, couple secret scars. A religious mercenary group who would just truck through Europe, swinging swords in the name of God. What a time. Number two, jesters. In the 12th century, the title of fool began, aka the jester was born. A paid career of mockery, smut, laughter, and 
tricks. A true triple threat. Most of the time, after years of service, these jesters were rewarded with land as payment for their loyal service. A famous fool named Roland Le Petour was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II when he retired after his foolery, under one condition, that every Christmas day, Roland would return to the royal court to leap, whistle, and fart. Yeah. Just a whole year to write a seven minute banger of a set. No pressure. But it wasn't just farts and jokes for these guys apparently. Jesters also had a huge role in battles. At war, their job was to wage psychological warfare, boosting the morale of their side the night before with laughter, parties, and stories. And in the morning, when the two armies met, the jesters would ride or run between them, calming the nerves of their own side and men by making them laugh, singing silly songs, of course, and insulting the opposition. Yeah, just chirping the other team. This was a ballsy tradition. And most of the time, unfortunately, they were captured and sent catapulted back with a message from the other side. Imagine just taunting 5,000 bloody drooling men hopped up on IPAs and no sleep, just mocking them, like, to their face. No thanks. Number one, sports. Yeah, back then it wasn't a friendly game of handshakes and sportsmanship and stuff. More like no rules kind of sports. Like no rule soccer, AKA mob soccer. Yeah, I'm not talking about the mafia mob. I'm talking about a mob as an unruly amount of people running amongst each other in havoc. Yeah, town versus town. An unlimited amount of players. There was only two rules of this game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's line on the other side of town and no murdering. Yeah, no murdering. Okay, so this is rugby. This sounds a lot like medieval rugby, doesn't it? This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed even at Oxford University in 1555. Secret fraternities and training areas were all agreed on by each organization. The game got so competitive, bloody and out of hand, it was eventually banned at tons of different times in England. Quote, there is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbids. We command and forbid on behalf of the king on pain of imprisonment, such a game to be used in the city in the future. Damn, like band band, huh? Thankfully, the game of football has calmed down over the years. <laughs> yeah, right. Just go to a Manchester versus Liverpool game. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe, and even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lances to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness, because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, tooth worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, 
a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, there was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. Number five is the legal protection of claiming sanctuary. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame depicts an iconic scene of Quasimodo swinging around on rope dramatically over the burning base of the Notre. Having just saved Esmeralda from an execution, he holds her aloft in the cathedral's terrace and screams out sanctuary. Sanctuary actually predates Christianity and originates far back into the 300s and existed until the 16th century. Every medieval law folded to the protections of sanctuary no matter the criminal's crime. Now, sanctuary seeking criminals might have been required to perform penance or go into exile, but they were at least guaranteed immunity from punishment. That's right, you could literally strangle someone and then run to the church to claim sanctuary and no one could come in and harm, arrest, or remove you for punishment. Sanctuary was abolished due to the new tide of judicial law and the arguments of crime, power, and punishment. Also because people should be punished for, I don't know, maybe taking someone else's life. Originally, before Christianity, it was temples such as the ones in Greek and Rome offering the solace, and it was part of the Roman law by the end of the 4th century to have it. Christianity adopted this practice to try and persuade people to join their religion when it started. Even after the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, churches maintained their authority to protect people who had broken major secular laws. Number four, let's meet the Yellow Ladies. Venice, Italy was an important trading post. Many people came and went, many travelers came to see the great city. But for those who had been at sea for a while, they may have wanted to see a little something else. As a result, medieval Venice was a massive red light district, enjoyed by many before their next voyages. Trying to control the number of ladies working the streets, the Venetian government made mandated in 1360 that brothels must be concentrated in the market and port districts. Obviously that just made their industry boom more since it was concentrated right where all the money came in and not dispersed, requiring men to travel farther out in convenient ways. Angry now that they weren't at least getting to capitalize off the potential tax revenue of these women, they in 
1420 decided to be accommodative of their Lady of the Night friend, the Venetian government accommodated more red light districts and implemented safety means within them, as well as the law of yellow. All women of the trade were to wear shades of yellow so as to be identifiable to their clientele, so random ladies just out on a stroll who happen to be in the area don't get harassed. But also it's a little bit of that classic shame tactic of making someone unwanted easily identifiable for discrimination. Number 3 is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions, and fashionable repairs became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8th, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restrictions six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflected both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for a special status items, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. Number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden. What? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano-Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsund by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Rockskild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. And finally, at number one, you either tuck it or you lose it. Medieval Wales was not playing around when it came to women being violated. If you were caught or perpetrator of this heinous crime, your options were to pay a dowry or get the little man chopped off. That's right, a violation such as this was actually considered a theft and was treated as such by the law. Should a perp pay the dowry, then legally the woman's virginity or body was restored in legal parameters. Can't or won't pay the fine? Well then, that was the end of down there for you. The reason for this, other than it being morally right, is that the fines and punishments hope to stop families from developing harmful feuds which would damage the wider society as a whole. This was not exclusive to Wales, however. This punishment shows up in the 1750s code of Constinian Marvodokot in Eastern Europe. It was not unheard of for women to also simply just take the law into their hands either. In a rural area of Shropshire near the Welsh border in 1405, Isabella Grawernus and her two daughters ambushed her attacker in a field, tied him up and did the dreaded snip snip and stole his horses to boot. All three women were subsequently pardoned. Number 10. Saving your pee pee. Back in the day, whole families, monasteries, and public meeting places would collect the pee pee deposited in chamber pots throughout the day. Yummy! They would take the amassed forbidden lemonade and either donate it, or if they were feeling enterprising, they could sell the wee wee to the town tanner or fuller. You see, the warm yellow liquid was used for the process of dyeing textiles and in the tanning of hides. Oh, and it was also used for cleaning clothes. Screw the smell of Tide and bounce dryer sheets, I'll take the smell of wetting the bed and grandpa's favorite chair, thank you very much. Urine was also used by physicians at the time to tell the health of their patients. I do this too, you know when it's clear and you feel like you're the most hydrated guy around, it's nice. I definitely don't taste it like the physicians back then though, or Saul Goodman in season 5 of Better Call Saul. I'll stick with apple juice for my favorite yellowish drink, thanks. Number 9, Belladonna. 
or commonly known as Deadly Nightshade. Now, what would our medieval ancestors be doing with such a lethal ingredient? Well, truth be told, it had a few uses. One of the more strange was for beauty. Belladonna had this strange effect on the pupils. The consumption of belladonna through eye drops or a liquid would result in dilated pupils, which for a long time in Europe was considered to be very beautiful. At least, it was considered beautiful. I don't know if that really is. The trouble, well, it's poison. It's like if you were complimenting me on my summer ready body, except I told you my secret was drinking Drano. Mm. To my surprise, however, this is an ingredient you can find today in certain medicines, combined with other ingredients. In small doses, it makes it not harmful. I thought it would be fun to talk about all the side effects as fast as I can. Dry mouth, dry skin, inability to sweat, muscle spasms, blurred vision, large pupils, hallucinations, inability to urinate, talk to Adam, convulsions, seizures, coma, acid reflux, fever, rapid heartbeat, gastrointestinal infection, high blood pressure, constipation, and more urination problems. Adam's the guy you need to talk to for that. Number eight. Barber for a brain transplant. No, not actually. I don't think they even knew what a brain transplant was, let alone how to perform one. But in the Middle Ages, barbers were not just responsible for cutting your hair and giving monks that lovely bald thing going on top. No, they were also responsible for tending to the wounded after doing battle, taking care of the sick, and all the other medical services that the actual physicians were too good for. It's actually the reason we see those red and white spinning signs outside barbers because it's symbolic of the bloody rags they would use to show that they could do the bloodletting required of monks in the Middle Ages. These barbers even formed a guild in the 13th century, lasting all the way up to the 18th century. Barbers are talented individuals. No one can cut my hair the way Tony does. Number seven, jesters. If you were to peer your nightshade eyes into a royal court, it might take a second because that stuff ain't good for you, you'll find a few things. First and foremost, you will see a king and his throne, the man who rules it all. Next to him would be a most beautiful queen, the woman who has it all. Hiding in the room upstairs are his mistresses. That's just how it goes. Loyal knights, advisors, cooks, everyone's here, as Mr. Sakurai would say, except for one missing person. Who? Me and, and Adam, the jesters. Oh, uh, hi. Sorry. The jesters, the jokers. Yes, no royal court is the same without the jester. The jester's job was to jest, laugh. He's a ye olde comedian. Now, it might seem like it sucks, especially because well, they wore strange attire and that hat was supposed to resemble that of an ass's ear or a donkey's ear, depending on what you want to say. But the jester possesses a unique power. No, not the power to fart on command. That's my power. The power to speak freely, or at least more freely than most. This was a time when speaking out against the king could lose your head. The jester could speak about the kings this way because, well, everything he said was taken as a joke. Some advice I think we could all take today. Number six. Everybody drinking. I recently went to go pick up some beers, and I went up to the cashier and I got my debit card out and prepped my ID. The cashier asked me, how do you want to pay? And I handed him my ID, being so accustomed to being confused for a prepubescent younger lad. He looked at me confused and said, nah, you're good bro, and boom, embarrassment. This interaction would never take place back in the medieval times because literally everyone was able to drink. It was usually the case to drink beer or wine and it was usually the case to drink beer or wine in place of clean water. Now they did have clean water before you all jump on me in the comments, but for when it wasn't on hand, beer and wine was accepted in its place. It was a common part of the medieval diet. I think they convinced themselves of this in the same way I tell myself it's okay to have another one. Well, it's made of grains with water, so that means it's healthy, right? Red wine is good for my heart, so drinking it right out of the bottle is okay, right? Probably not. Number five, Sin Eater. This is one of the most metal job titles around. I'm pretty sure the Sin Eater was a boss in Elden Ring, wasn't he? He's in Caelid somewhere. This is definitely one of the more unholy jobs in this list. Not as disgusting as gut stringing or crap slinging, but pretty horrid in its own right. Sin Eaters ate sins, and the best way to eat a metaphorical concept of wrongdoing was to eat bread off the corpse of someone who died recently. The idea being that the sins of the man would be transferred onto the bread? I don't know. Anyway, they eat the sins and the deceased gets to go off to heaven without worrying about their history, could go on peacefully, and the sin eaters make some coin. They were willing to take a risk dooming their mortal soul for a bit of coin. Man's gotta eat. I wonder though, is it worth it? Like what if you eat too many sins and you don't have any room for dessert? Do sins have an added flavor? I imagine it's got like just a little kick, like a sriracha, like it's a little hot on your tongue. Number four, lime burner. Now a lime burner doesn't sound so bad at first. Lime mortar is a common building material, being traced back to the first 
century, but it's not particularly easy to work with. Bear with me while I try to explain the technicals, I'm not as smart as a first century engineer, you see. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, taking the stone and cooking it in a kiln at around a cool 800 degrees. It's not too bad, right? Well that carbon monoxide has got to go somewhere, mostly in the air. All that carbon monoxide and dust chalk would just float around in the air where you'd be taking big heavy deep breaths in and I'm not sure how much you know about carbon monoxide but it's consistently the number one spot on Rolling Stones magazine list of top 100 substances to not breathe in. On top of this, did you know that superheated lime mortar is violently volatile against water? Meaning that if you were to sue, you know, sweat in a building that was 800 degrees at any given time, it would have disastrous consequences. Be careful. Number three, rat catcher. It doesn't sound fancy, but it's exactly what it says in the tin. You catch rats. You gotta wonder why you wouldn't just outsource this to the cat community. They're very good at this sort of thing. Rats, cute as I find them, at the time were filled to bursting with plague, disease, all kinds of grossness. Castle stock rooms were filled with grain, vegetables, and herbs, and if you're a rat, those are the things that make life worthwhile. Rats were a problem for nobility, but an even bigger issue for common folk and peasants, because if these little rats ate up what little grain you had, you would go destitute fast. But oh, come on, who can say no to their little posies and their little eyesies? I'm biased, I love rats. I would be a rat catcher if I could. Some rat catchers allegedly were reported to have raised their own supply of rats in order to squeak a few extra dollars out of the town. That's hilarious, by the way, love that scheme. Now traditionally, their methods would involve things like leaving out traps or poisoned herbs. That wasn't always enough though, so rat catchers would also invoke the old methods, namely, magic and try to entice rats away with spells. This often didn't work terribly well since rats are naturally resistant to magic, like everybody knows this. Number two, plague bearer. The plague ravaged London and Europe, leaving behind a wake of bodies and a stack of corpses as high as your medieval eyes could see. So somebody had to deal with all of that, right? A street sweeper of sorts was needed. You remember in Monty Python and the Holy Grail when Eric Idle is going around ringing his little bell, telling everyone to come bring out their dead? Hilarious, right? Well, it's partly based on reality because this is more or less what a plague bearer really was. The parish would hire out plague bearers who would then tour the streets of the village or town or whatever, wagon in hand, collecting the bodies of the ailing and dead to go dump in a mass graveyard shortly after. Tons of fun! They would spend their nights surrounded by dead bodies and their days in the church with the same dead bodies because according to the church's law, they were required to live there to prevent spreading what they were dealing with to anyone else. This might be history's first case of social distancing. And finally, at number one of the jobs you don't want is executioner. We've all heard of this one, and we're probably conjuring up a pretty vivid image of a burly shirtless monster in a black hood with a big ol' axe or something, wielded by someone who can't get enough of their day job and love their passion of separating necks from heads. In actuality, medieval people weren't that psychotic, and most executioners didn't join the practice out of a love of the game, but were usually coerced into it. Some were butchers who were called to the job, some were criminals who could do the job in exchange for a reduced sentence, but most commonly, it was a family business. If your dad was the town executioner, it was very likely you would be next in line to wear the hood. Now the downsides to this job seem immediately obvious, unless you're super into bloodshed and death, it's Probably not the cheeriest job, seems like the kind of thing you, you take home with you, you know? Kind of hard to lay loose and relax after that. But you know what's worse than the weight of taking another man's life? Social isolation. Executioners were not particularly well liked, looked down upon as outcasts, sometimes even forced to live outside of town. Ah, uh, well, you know what, executioner? It could be worse. You could be the groom of the stool, you could be a nightman. So, count your blessings. 